It's Q&A time again. Let's get into it. So the YouTube channel has reached 24,000 subscribers, and that is so awesome. Um, thank you guys so much for watching and subscribing, sharing and commenting. Uh, the channel's grown a lot over a short period of time, and I really, really appreciate that. I know that not all of you that are watching have subscribed, so all you need is a Google account, and you just click that button to subscribe. Uh, you'll get my videos in your newsfeed on YouTube homepage, and uh, you'll be able to know when new videos come up, which is Mondays and Friday mornings, if you didn't know already. And before we get into the q and I do need to thank my patrons. Uh, they help keep things going when YouTube doesn't pay me very well. And, um, and it's just a consistent source of income for a uh, small business that is super important. I wouldn't really be able to do any of this without their help. So um, thank you, patrons, so much. All right, the first question comes from Michael. I have a folder with literally hundreds of loops and I'm wanting to organize them. I've accumulated these over a number of years and they are extremely varied. Any advice on how to organize them for easy recall? So I am the same way. I've got tons of loops that I've been collecting since like 2005 and they are sorted into different folders for, based on where they came from usually, but they definitely need to be organized because there's a lot of stuff I just don't use because the file names don't match the search strings that I use. So let's look at a couple options here. I'll show you my sample library uh, to begin with. So I've got the sample library folder organized by impulse responses, a sample library folder. Uh, this is a uh, folder for native instruments. It just That's like, they just install into that folder. And then another folder of just MIDI files. So, um, so I would recommend organizing it something like that. And I'll just tag that with the same color as the other ones. All right, so into the sample library folder, there are, I've got different colors for different things. So blue is like general sound effects, stuff that I might use on films, um, ambiences, Foley sort of sounds. And then the yellow are any sample libraries for music. Um, and it, some stuff kind, kind of goes in between, but in general, uh, that the yellow ones are my music ones. And then there's the blue ones for film work. And then there's some others that are untagged, which are like my my folders for like when I'm editing something, when I record a sound effect, I need to edit it. I have those original project files there. Um, so everything's organized usually by the developer. So like Ghost Hack samples are there, Woodshed Audio, um, the Geist 2 library is in here. If I look in here and then there's the content and then different folders. And this is all just organized by the developer. But if I'm looking at um, some of the old stuff, drum machine samples. This is just from different drum machines. Um, I downloaded this from somewhere. I don't know. But this is not usually how I use my sample libraries. I'm usually inside of Reaper, and I'm using the Media Explorer. So let's look at that a little bit. So in the Media Explorer, we can um, navigate through the same sort of file list um, by just adding in that uh, folder into the sidebar, but we could also make databases, and databases are going to make searching a lot faster. I've got dedicated videos on the Media Explorer and uh, databases, so I don't want to cover too much, but let's just focus on loops. So I'll go to my loops library, which contains multiple um, file paths. Uh, you can see here, so these are all the folders that I've added to, um, to this database. It's Now a lot of these are things like dance loops and things. So 70 dance 14.rx2. What the hell is that? It's probably a drum loop. Uh, it actually is. So I'll just play that. So it's a drum loop. Um, if we search for drum, that's not going to come up. So we got hip hop drums, anything with drum in the title. So if we want to organize this properly, well, I should say one easy way to do this is inside of Reaper. There's the different metadata columns. We can't edit those directly inside of Reaper, but we can go over to the custom tag, a right click, 
edit custom tag, and we can add in drum. And now at least drum is there. Those dance loops are now visible because we added the custom tag drum. So at the very least, this is one way that you can organize things fairly quickly. You can kind of batch your tags that way. If you want to do drum and EDM, you can't just add in EDM. Um, you would have to, well, it would be like drum EDM. And if I search for EDM, those are still visible. And something else to keep in mind is that those tags don't write to the files. It's just inside of this database. Um, and you can only get those custom tags in the database, not in the like the file view here. So that's how I do it. You could also go into something like uh, BWF meta edit and then import those files and then actually commit your tags to the broadcast wave tags. And that's again, only gonna work with broadcast wave files. And I do have a video on metadata editing. All right, next question. The next question comes from Jaren. Is that an AKG K240 headphone you're using? And if so, what about that great thick green cable homemade? Had a few people asking about this uh, before. So these are AKG K240, uh, the originals, K240 Studio. Um, you know, cheap headphones, but good sound quality, great kind of all around studio headphones. Um, the cable broke on these, so I decided to make my own. I got some thin microphone cable. Um, that cable is actually reused from uh, a studio in Vancouver, redid their patch bay or something, so they had tons of kind of medium length um, cable lengths. Good quality cable, but it was like, you know, you have to solder on your own connectors and things like that. So I went to a local shop called RP Electronics, and I got this mini XLR, probably won't be able to see it, but it's a mini XLR connector that works with the headphones jack. Um, and then the other end is a just a mono price connector. It's just one I had, but you can always get Neutrik or you know any other good quality connector. The green stuff is called TechFlex, and it just slips on top of the cable before you solder it. Don't forget to put heat shrink on it as well. It's it's super simple to solder this stuff. It's three wires, so you can't really mess it up as long as you, you know connect it the right way. Heat shrink it, um, clean your solder points, all that kind of stuff. It was a very easy thing to build. Worked first try, and yeah, really happy with it. The TechFlex, it makes the cable a little less flexible, but also it doesn't break when it like gets run over by a chair, pinched in a drawer. Or, stepped on and things like that. Uh, just makes it a lot more durable. And makes it, you know, fancy. People like to ask questions about it. That's always cool. Next question comes from Nick's Piano. Do you ever feel like you have everything you need? I actually feel that way now, but keep searching for the next piece of gear. Keep in mind I'm a hobbyist with very little time to spend in my humble studio. So maybe I live a bit vicariously through you living the dream. Well, I wouldn't say I live the dream, but I do work from home. I get to make music. Um, I get to talk to people about gear and techniques and things like that. I, I I really appreciate what I have. I do feel like I have everything I need, or in the back of my mind, I know that I have everything I need. But part of the fun of this is to look at the gear, to look at different things that can improve my workflow, get me inspired by things. Um, so you know, maybe I don't technically need another preamp because uh, I got a rack of preamps here that I haven't turned on in like eight or nine months. But I look at those things because they're they're cool. They're, you know, they're they're tools that we can use. They have different colors. They have different features that can make things sound better or easier to use and things like that. Really, all you need these days is, you know, a computer that's decent. I choose a MacBook. Um, good pair of headphones like those AKGs or the Sennheiser uh, 650s basic audio interface. I've chosen the audio fuse and I have um, microphones. So sure SM7B, this Rode NTG2 gets the most used uh, so far this year. But I mean, you don't need a lot to make music these days. 
Um, you can get a good recording with just really basic gear. Honestly, I could probably get a good recording with just a Zoom little portable recorder. You don't need a lot these days um, because everything is pretty good sounding. Um, it's all just a matter of putting the time in to learn it, learn the techniques, learn how to mix, um, learn how to listen, um, he being able to hear compression and EQ changes, things like that. You know, that's the tricky part, but the gear is kind of the fun part. Researching gear, buying gear, trying it out, listening and comparing it to what you had before, finding the sweet spot of that piece of gear where it sounds the best. And the same thing kind of applies to plugins. So they inspire us, they get us to work in different ways, they save time, or they sound great. But at the end of the day, we can get by with a whole lot less. Good question. I would definitely like to kind of uh, scale things back a little bit because I hate clutter. My desk is an absolute nightmare right now. Um, but I, I know that I can live with a lot less and I might even be happier with a lot less. Next question comes from Sai. Noticed that you seem to use VST and VST-i in Reaper. Is that a technical preference? I've had various issues with AUs in the past and various software that I use. I, I found that the VST format is just better supported all around in validation tests and preset support. Apple have tinkered with the AU spec in recent OS updates leading to breakages, and VST remains immune to all that. So um, that's kind of what I found when I switched to Mac, I was using a combination of audio unit and VST and between different projects. And um, sometimes in the same project, I'd use like, you know, two different versions. And I'd, I'd notice that like one thing didn't quite work right in that version. But pretty much I stick with the VSTs uh, with the added benefit of being able to take my project and open it on a Windows machine. There's that reason. Um, which I think is a big one if you ever do collaboration, you need to share plugin settings um, or the project file. Um, being able to open the project on, a, on Windows or Mac um, is important. The second thing is that a lot of audio unit plugins are not written as audio unit plugins from the ground up. They're usually written as VST first, converted to audio unit, kind of like wrapped. So it's technically the VST, but with some extra things to make it work in Logic and Ableton Live. But if that is the case, then just stick with the VST format. But if there's a plugin that is audio unit only, there's no reason not to use that one um, because it's, you know, that's just one platform they have to support. And so the probably the support is pretty good for that plugin. The last question comes from Grant. My mastering workflow involves three to four monitoring plugins that I always move to my second monitor every time. I have to move them over every single time I reopen a session or start a new one. Is there a way for Reaper to remember the default window positions for certain plugins? So the best way to do this is to have those plugins in your monitoring effects chain so they're always available, and then set up a screen set to open them on that second monitor or wherever you want them on the screen in one button press. You can even have this set up so that when you load in your mastering project, it automatically loads that screen set. So I'll show you that. I'll show you all this right now. All right, so back in Reaper, we've got, I'm gonna close that uh, doc and we'll go to the monitoring effects chain. And in here, I have a bunch of plugins. Some of these are for video, some of these are for uh, mastering. So when I'm mastering, I often um, set my levels with a pink noise generator. I'll use Dynameter, I'll use, um, VUMT, there it is. And I might use a LUFS meter like this one. The Ulean one is really great and I just kind of forgot to install it recently. So anyways, you take your plugins, let's say Vumped Deluxe, put it here. And maybe I'll scale that down to 50%. So I've got that here, I've got Dynameter, I've already set this up to go into the second monitor, but for this video, I need to have it on the first monitor. And I'll take my frequency spectrum analyzer, which I had up there, and I'll shrink this down. So I don't know, maybe it's down here, something like that. So then I will close the monitoring effects chain or any other thing I don't want visible. I probably want my 
my uh, mixer visible, but let's take off the sends. I never use sends when I'm mastering, so uh, uncheck show sends when size permits. And now, so it's just inserts here. And then I'm gonna save a, a screen set. And if you don't know how to get to the screen sets window, it's in the view menu, screen sets and layouts. So we're going to the windows page. So I've got one set up for mastering already. You can see the, the key to load it and the key to save it. And of course you can edit the shortcuts in here. I like one, two, three, four, five for my recalling of a screen set and shift one, two, three, four, five for saving a screen set. So I'm just going to do that here with shift three, brings up this window, give it a name, check everything. So tool window positions, that's, that's your plugins. The main window position, that's this window here. Um, Docker selected tab, so having the mixer visible in a dock or not. Mixer flags is having the sends visible or not. Uh, you can also choose where things are focused. I usually keep that off. Sometimes if last focus was the um, the effects chain, then if you go to type something, then it's gonna start searching. So maybe you want that, maybe you don't. So I could go to preset or screen set one, it looks like this. Screen set two looks like this and screen set three. Oh, see, there you go. Went into the search bar. But here I've loaded screen set three and those plugins are there now. Then let's go into the action list. And so let's say your mastering workflow is on screen set three, we're going to copy the selected command ID. We're going to start up action. And so with SWS extension, there's set project startup action, double click that and click yes. You paste in the ID of the action you want to run when you start the project and click OK. And then it'll confirm that for you. So now when I load this project, it's going to load these windows in this position. So you just want to save that into your um, project file, your mastering template. Uh, so when you load in that mastering template, before you import any files or anything, these windows will pop up for you. And that's it for this Q&A session. Thank you so much for watching. Here's a list of my top patrons. These guys really, really help keep this thing going. As I said before, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash the Reaper blog. Um, donate as little as a dollar per month. Uh, you'll get some exclusive things. And yeah, help keep this thing going. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Follow me on Facebook and Twitter. Join our Facebook group, Reaper Blog Community, and visit reaperblog.net for a lot more tutorials. See ya.